Um, in the old analog PSTN, you know, you had an analog line that terminated in a particular place and mechanically in a switch, in a switching center, and the place where that line was terminated at the switching center determined its address because there were mechanical, electromechanical switches that led a path to that place to connect telephone calls. Um, and this is why it's called circuit switch to left hand, because all these relays and all these relays would close and it would form a completed circuit from one place to another with a few amplifiers in between to keep the, to keep the quality up. So this is a photograph. Um, <laughs> this is not an ancient photograph. This is a photograph from two years ago. This is an old analog switch. Over here you see uh, like a BT100 console. That BT100 console is connected to an 8-bit microcomputer. And the 8-bit microcomputer controls thousands of relays in these cards. Each one of these cards programs runs two telephone lines. So this isn't an office building. This is actually a small island in the Pacific. This is their national telephone network. Um, a bunch of power lines come in, a bunch of, sorry, a bunch of telephone cables come in from all over the island. They go into this punch down panel. Then they go back under the floor and come up in the back of that rack. And you can stand next to this thing and you can literally listen to the relays chattering when people are making phone calls and you're clicking and buzzing and all kinds of noise and other things. For the geek factor, um, would this be similar to something like a, like a stepper system or like an ESS yeah. system? It's more like an ESS. This is, this is more advanced than a stepper. Like, so there's this 8-bit microcomputer mm -hmm. and there are these buses that run the length of each rack. And then there are buses that run, then there are cables that run between the rack connecting the buses. So I don't, I don't know how many buses are in the back of that thing, but that does little, the number of buses in the back plane will limit the number of calls this thing can handle sometimes. So around 1980, something new happened called SS7, signaling system number seven. Uh, analog lines, for the most part, were replaced with synchronous digital lines. ISDN is uh, sort of close, ISDN is very close related to emergency SS7. They sort of come out of the same world. Uh, signaling media can now travel in different channels, they can travel in different logical channels, they can travel in different physical channels, they can follow completely different paths around the world. But the big thing, the big, big <coughs> thing that happened with SS7 that was huge in, 1980, in the 1980s was that the SS7 network was really a sort of general purpose computer network that spanned the globe. And the global telephone network is just an application running on the SS7 network. And this was a huge shift in the nature of telephone. And SS7 is so good at what it does that it's still in use and will probably continue to be in use for quite a long time. So we use the SS, you all use the SS7 network every day. And most people, it's like the frickin' matrix. Most people just don't even think about it. <laughs> but, but again, again, at this point, phone numbers are no longer physical address for their interest in a routing database. Um, this opened the way for things like number portability, which um, telecom engineers tell us to make the United States a special nightmare. But, uh, what is one, one thing about SS7? Uh, where does it connect to the whole uh, infrastructure? I mean, does it just do the transfer between every uh, house and the general switch? Uh, it, it depends on where you are in the world. If you're in, if you're in Germany, um, your ISDN line your ISDN line goes through a few layers of, of tunneling and wrapper management, you know, wrapper rearrangement, and then emerges and it, it emerges to the SS7 user part in the, you know, in the SS7. Um, the same thing happens with cell phones. So layer three call control messages in GSM, layer three call control messages go almost directly into the mobile switching center. Um, everything else is just a tunnel that carries layer three messages from the handset in the mobile switching center. Which is why projects like Osmocom BB scare the shit out of carriers. Okay? Because it means people can start buzzing their mobile switching centers from outside. That's never really been a possibility before. And it frightens them. Um, so, and you know, a GSM mobile switching center, it's an Indian SS7 network, but all a GSM mobile switching center is, is someone took a big ISDN switch and they added another software package to it called the mobile application part. And suddenly you've just turned your ISDN switch into a mobile switching center for the side of the So we talked about Q931 call control, we're going to talk about it again. 
Um, this is this is the actual sort of ladder diagram for call set and Q931 and Q931 protocol. Um, and this is at the ISDN level. The the I the ISUP uh, stuff that happens in the SS7 side is actually simplified from this. So this is what you this is what you see at the subscriber level. Um, the setup message, somebody dials a number, the setup message carries the dial number that goes into the network. The network sends back an acknowledgement that's called the call proceeding message. It just says, yeah, I got your setup message, we're working on it. At some point, the remote phone starts ringing, and when that happens, you receive an alerting message on your end. It tells you the phone is ringing, we, we establish contact with the other party, and the phone's ringing up there. Then when somebody answers, you get the connect message. You issue the connect acknowledge back to the network, and at that point, the call's connected. And at this point, the microphone on both phones uh, is still enabled. Actually, the microphone on the phone probably got enabled at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, when you're done, you know, you hang up on one side, some side hangs up, the terminal issues a disconnect message to the network. The network sends back the release message. This is just handshaking, release complete, dial tone, calls up. So, hey, that's nice. What, what's wrong with this? Why do we need to change that? So, voice over IP. Um, basically, the, the key part is you're going to replace the synchronous lines in SS7 <coughs> with, with packet switched lines. You're going to run them over an IP network. That's sort of like the beginning of a process that then gets very complicated. Um, but again, like SS7, the following things are in common. Signal and media can follow entirely different paths and use entirely different protocols. Uh, and your telephone network is now just an application running on top of the general purpose computer network. Uh, and the switch is just a, it's a computer shuffling packets around. Um, so voice over IP has a lot in common with SS7. The main difference is that it's designed to run over, it's designed to run on top of IP networks instead of over um, synchronous lines like T1s. So some specifics. Um, SS7 protocols come out of the ITU. The VoIP protocols come out of the um, IETF. SIP is defined in RFC code 3261. SIP is surprisingly complicated for what it does. Um, really, I mean, you look, you look at a typical SIP message. The format of a SIP message looks like an ATT and HTTP method. A SIP method, the format of it, if you just look at it, it looks like email headers or HTTP or something. But you'll, you'll notice that in any, given, in any given message, you usually have three different addresses that apply to three different, three different routing scopes for three different elements of, of the transaction. You have multiple tags, multiple tags, each of which is supposed to be unique in a particular different scope. Um, you know, there, there are things like saying, well, I sent you the message, but you send the reply back over there. It's just, it's a rat's nest. It, it, it turns into a mess very quickly. <coughs> the the media. Actually, this RFC just specifies the basic C. Yes. But when you say C, people usually mean uh, much more than this RFC. Oh, uh, yeah. This is just the start. I mean, this is like a okay. tens of RFCs which extend this basic protocol. <coughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. This, this is just so like the beginning of understanding what SIP is. And then on top of that, for every new service that anyone ever wants to do on SIP, there's a new RFC telling how to run the service on top of SIP. So, um, Real-time protocol, another RFC. This is the protocol we use for media. Um, basically RFC, I mean the RTP protocol is packets full of vocoder information or video information with timestamps and sequence numbers. Um, and it's not a reliable protocol, it's just usually run over UDP. One of the nice things, nice things about real-time streaming media is that if packets get lost, they're lost when you're not catching up. You just keep running. So there's not a lot, there's no handshake. RTP continues sequence, uh, cont um, contains sequence numbers? Yeah. Yes. It contains timestamps and sequence numbers. Uh, okay, timestamps I know, but sequence numbers I'm also familiar with. You can never have enough redundancy. <laughs> 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 Um, well, I forget whether the, whether the packet sequence numbers or whether they're sample sequence numbers within the packets, but there are sequence numbers in addition to time um, Now, the funny thing is both these protocols are, are used internally 
by some of the sodium carriers right now in 4G networks, except they call them IMS. Um, they call them IMS partly because they had to add, in, in wonderful 3GBP style, they had to add a whole other layer of, of, of over-engineering on top of what was already an over-engineering protocol, SIP. And um, then they have to call it IMS instead of, instead of VoIP because they don't want you to think you're using Vonage or something. They still want to, <laughs> they still want to charge you know, SS7 rates for your services. So this is SIP call flow. And after tying ourselves up in knots on the protocol, you see a ladder diagram that looks suspiciously like what you saw in ICANN. Nice. You have the invite message. So somebody dials the number. The invite message carries the dialed number to the other side. Uh, the trying message is just um, an acknowledgement of the invite. When the remote party starts training, you get the ringing 180 response. And these response numbers that are the 100 series responses, 200 series responses, the, the, the series of responses mean the same thing as an HTTP. 100 responses are temporary progress messages, 200 responses are, are successful result codes, 300 responses are, are um, redirects. Yeah, redirects. 400 responses are unsuccessful terminations, 500 responses are not. So it means a lot of these, the response numbers mean the same. Um, you know, the response, the remote party answers 200 OK, acknowledgement, calls connected. The only thing that's really different is there's one less layer of handshaking at the end. The big difference that we don't show in this diagram with SIP is that every one of these messages can carry different information about how it's supposed to be routed or where it's supposed to go. So, OpenBTS. These are the design principles behind OpenBTS. So why explain all this to get to this slide? We're here. Woo! Um, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, you know, the design principles behind OpenBTS, one is to put as little functionality as possible into GSM-specific software. We're not out to implement the 3 GPP specifications to any more degree than is absolutely necessary to have a functional system. Okay? Um, for us, the 3, 3GPP is just, it's an error interface specification, and we really don't want to carry beyond that. Uh, this is very different from the OpenBSC project. If we go to OpenBSC, the goal in OpenBSC is to actually do a, a, a faithful but compact implementation of all the various elements of the conventional network. Our approach is different. Our approach is the only, the only legitimate purpose for that spec is to talk with the company. And everything beyond that, shed, shed that specification as quickly as you can. Um, and we also want to move things into external applications. So OpenBTS itself, we, we don't want to become a kitchen sink for different types of functionality. So if you want to implement some new functionality in OpenBTS, the right way to do it is first, yeah, the right way to do it is to first see if you can do it with SIP. There may be an RFC out there telling you how to implement an equivalent, an equivalent service with SIP if there is a user. If not, a good approach is often to implement it using HTTP so that your, your server for this new service can be implemented, uh, basically be implemented as some sort of plugin on a, on a web server. Um, and then you translate GSM layer 3 to some HTTP request to get what you need on an external server. And this is a very different approach from what you might see in the OpenBSC. It's also a very different approach from what you see in the conventional networks. Because one thing this approach does is it opens the door for web application developers to start writing for network applications for telecom, which is a huge change in the way that software is generated. So, other principles. OpenBTS itself wants to be invisible. So when your voice over IP core network is talking to a GSM handset through OpenBTS, it should be like talking to any other generic SIP endpoint. The fact that it's talking to OpenBTS, the fact that there are GSM radio channels and all this other crap going on behind the scenes should be irrelevant. You should be able to ignore that and just talk SIP to some, some endpoint. Um, and then we do a hack. We present each handset as a SIP user with this name where we basically take the 15 digits of the MZ, which is the only true identity the handset has, and we prefix it with you know, the letters I, M, N, S, I, just to make our lives easier so we can distinguish MZs from really long telephone numbers. Yeah, uh, uh, can, can you explain again, please? So is this hack? 
I'm sorry. Okay. I, so I let's know. say let's say your handset attaches to the OpenETS network. Yeah. Um, and you do a location update request. You send a location update request to OpenETS. OpenETS. I'll show the diagram. Okay. OpenETS takes that location update request and presents it to the core network as a SIP register method. Yeah. The username that will appear in the SIP register method is MZ. And uh, it's my MZ. Right. Ah, uh, okay. You use it for the register at the asterisk or whatever is. Correct. Okay, now I understand. Thank you. And then the IP address, from the point of view of the serving VoIP network, your IP address is the IP address of your serving base station. Yeah. And the, and the base station is just a bridge between the radio stuff and the wired, Correct. or maybe wired stuff. Correct. And it's also a bridge between the ISDN stuff and the SIP stuff. Okay. So if you look at the structure of OpenBTS, what you have, you have radio resource management that's built in, and then the rest of it from layer three up looks a lot like a SIP ISDN gateway. So this is how we translate a mobile originated call. And my apologies if this is backwards from a normal, backwards orientation from a normal ladder diagram. Well, I'll show these parts. So it starts, again, the first, the first step is you establish a radio channel. The channel request message is sent on, sent on a channel called the um, random access channel. A response to the channel request message is called an immediate assignment message. It's, it's sent on a unicast channel uh, called the common control channel. Um, but at that point, the handset's been assigned to a dedicated channel, a D, a, a D channel, an ISDN terminology. The next thing that happens, the handset sends something called a CM service request, which is basically saying, I want to, you know, here's my identity. I want to establish a connection. I want to establish a connection with a building manager on sub layer. Um, in this case, we're cheating a little bit. We're turning around, we're sending a CM service step. In most networks, it would be an authentication step that would happen in the middle there. But you can, you don't have to authenticate at that point. You can say, well, the phone, if the phone registered, we must have authenticated it when it registered, so we don't need to authenticate it now. All our carriers do that because it makes the call connection more snappy. Um, you send back a CM service, service accept, say, yeah, is this phone provisioned for this service? Yes, it is. Boom, you're accepted. Go. And it's just checking your MZ against a provisioning list. Okay. Um, one, one thing about this uh, a step. If I use, uh, if it is technically possible or, or not, is uh, out of scope. I use one OpenBTS uh, cell, and then I have U in the cell. Then I build a bridge to another cell phone and connect this to the original Vodafone or Swisscom or whatever is out there, okay. then your traffic sending from the mobile is, um, is not encrypted. Sure. Okay. There's no end in encryption in, in, any, in any of these SS7 type, ISDN type networks, there is no end in encryption. Everything is exposed. Everything that goes through the switch is exposed. And if you're running the switch, then it's exposed when it's in the switch. Even if, even if you could use the encryption, even if you could reverse engineer and set K of I, it doesn't matter. Because it's still wide open. So what happens next, this is the Q931 call ladder you saw earlier. This is the SIP call ladder that you saw earlier. And it's really just a matter of matching up corresponding steps so that the phone moves through the right series of states in both domains simultaneously and ends up in the same call. And these are corresponding messages in the in the, in the SIP and ISM games. Okay. Yeah. Next, we're going to talk about how we do authentication in OpenBTS. Um, it's trivial to produce a SIM with a clone MZ. It's, it's trivial. So 
what's in the sim is um, a secret key called KBI. So I believe it's 128 bits long. So 128, so maybe correct me on that. Anyway. KBI is only supposed to exist in two places, in the sim and in a place called the authentication center, which is a piece of the home location register back to your home carrier. It should never be exposed anywhere else. So you verify that the phone has the right KBI in the sim doing challenge response authentication, just basic challenge response authentication. The network sends a nonce to the phone, says hash this nonce with your KFI and send it back the result. The authentication center does an identical calculation. The network compares the two results. You're authenticated. Note that you, uh, the network authenticated you, you never authenticated the network. The network could just lie and say, yeah, I'm hash. I'm Vodafone. Oh. Um, nothing prevents that from happening. So, um, there are two parameters that are part of the authentication. One's KBI and something the other is <coughs> what authentication algorithm are you going to use? And GSM terminology, GSM, uh, the specification doesn't actually, the original specification doesn't actually define any of the security algorithms. It just designates them with numbers. And the algorithm that's used for this authentication process is, is designated A3. Um, so you can have different A3s, and when you order SIMs, you tell the SIM vendor what A3 you want used in your SIMs. And the home location register also has to know what A3 was used in your SIM. So originally, they used something called Comp 128. The story of Comp 128 is like, this is so typical engineering. Um, the specification, the specification that originally described a, the function of A3 as an appendix gave an example, an example hash function called Comp 128. And the appendix specifically said, we are providing this as an example for use in testing and proof of concept. We do not recommend it for use in production networks. So naturally, Naturally, it became the standard in the first generation of SIM cards actually issued by carriers. Um, it was eventually replaced. After, after enough years of fraud, they finally got tired of it. Replaced. But, but one of the keys here is that if you're going to issue your own SIMs and you're going to actually do authentication, you have to have the software to implement the A3 algorithm that was used in the SIM. And of the stuff that's available publicly, Comp 128B1 is available publicly. Um, Comp 128B3, which is more commonly used today, is not publicly available. You have to be a member of the GSMA to get it. But there are some more recent open source, I say open source, the software itself is an open source, but the algorithms are published. There are more recent openly published algorithms that are used for authentication in more recent systems. But you, you have to have the point, though, is that if you're going to issue your own SIM cards and actually have to secure an authentication, not only do you have to know the KFI that you put in the SIM card, but you also have to have an implementation of the A3 algorithm that's used in the SIM card. So, the Open PTS network performs authentication using a component called the subscriber registry. Um, the subscriber registry is um, probably best described as a SIP, a SIP proxy. Um, and all the SIP register transactions that happen in the network and in a normal OpenBTS configuration happen in this piece of software called the subscriber registry. And its only purpose is to process these registration codes. So when we start installing all this stuff, one of the things you have to install when you install OpenBTS, you have to install the subscriber registry. You don't have to install it on your base station machine itself. You can install it anywhere, anywhere in the network, but you have to have one somewhere. And it's, it's just, it just runs off of for an HLR to choose an SQLite database file. If I, confer, uh, if I configure my asterisk to using uh, OpenBTS, um, then I have uh, so-called um, DaleConf. I'm, I'm not familiar right now. Where you can write down the numbers and so on. Then you have first to use uh, to know the email for the register of the... You have to know the MC. Uh, sorry, the IMSI, yeah. sorry. Uh, the IMSI, so I said, okay, when this IMSI is coming, then um, use this number for it. So 
people who can call from outside or somewhere else. Right. Uh, and then I have uh, a successful um, communication. So, yeah, and the way we do with asterisks and, and, and the subscriber registry, yeah. we run asterisks in what's called real time mode. Okay. So that after, we don't we don't use the normal SIP configuration table. Okay. The SIP.com. Yeah. We don't use that for configuring handsets. Instead, what you're going to do, and this is one of the hardest parts of installing OpenBTS, <laughs> is you have to configure asterisk to use an external database for its registry information. Okay. The then, same database that the subscriber registry application uses. Okay. So the subscriber registry performs register operations on this a table called SIP Buddies in this database. The subscriber registry performs IP address updates in that table. Yes. It also gets authentication information out of that table. Yes. Then Asterisk uses that same table to route calls to the right IP address. Now if you're running a single BTS system, this is all simple because all the IP addresses are just local hosts anyway. Yes. But when you start to run multiple BTS systems, this is, it's, you really have to pay attention. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Um, so, you know, if what we did, we take the pre-existing asterisk SIP buddies database schema and we add some fields to it. We add K of I for SIMs that we issue ourselves. We keep a copy of the most recent um, RAM. RAM is the nonce that's used in the authentication. SRS is the result. So we keep the most recent authentication exchange, the most recent authentication tool. tool. And we also keep a string that tells which A3D the algorithm is supposed to be used for the subscriber. So different subscribers can have different A3D What's A8? Um, A8 is yeah, usually yeah. the same as A3. A8 is used, to use, it's used for generating KFC. But usually A3 and A8 are the same. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, um, the round number, so the nonce, uh, how big is it? Um, how many bits? 128 bits. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah, question. Did I understand you right that this is only if you want to issue your own uh, the SIM cards and you want to have secure authentication for these, or let's say some sort of uh, authentication for these, but you could just lie as the network and simply accept anyone sure. from your BTS? Okay. Sure, <coughs> sure. And if you don't want authentication, if you don't care about authentication and you're not trying to do text messaging, then you can use asterisk as your registry server. So there are two reasons that we move the registry database into an external database. One is so that we can do authentic, we can use we can use it as an authentication mechanism. The second reason is when we start running text messaging, your text messaging server has to be able to get access to the IP address of the serving base station. So that's the second reason we move it into an external database. So that your text messaging server can also find it. Um, again, if you're only running one BTS, you can hard code all your addresses and not do all this. But in multi BTS networks, all this matters. Yeah? Is roaming possible in that uh, configuration if you have multiple BTS? I wonder because. So, what do you mean by roaming? Yeah. Um, a mobile phone being connected to one base station and while moving uh, on the radio channel, like a small handover. It's handover. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's handover. The, uh, well, the answer was going to be yes either way, but in the case, yes, handover. There are actually two implementations of handover for open BTS right now, and they both work. So, okay, so uh, if I understand uh, correctly, you have one real-time asterisk in the middle, Yeah. and then you have a lot of BTS, uh, open BTS space stations uh, around it. That's the simplest configuration. No. Yes. What is the crazy one? No, um, I so understand you that you have uh, to deal with IP addresses. So if you have a lot of uh, open BTS uh, stations out there, and then you have one a real time asterisk in the middle, right. then you have to deal with, uh, with this IP address thing. Yes, and okay. that's why when, when a phone comes to register, one of the things that we do is we record, we record the IP address of the certain base station in its database. Now, okay. So then when we have to route a call to that phone, we know where to find it. Yeah, okay. Now I'm with you. Okay. 
So the second part of the the second part of this database, the second table in the database, is the dialing table. And all the dialing table does is associate phone numbers with them. It just says, um, you know, if someone dials this number, dial it to that MC. It's just that's all it is. Um, and you can certainly have multiple entries. You can have multiple phone numbers associated with any given MZ. You just put multiple entries in the database, as long as you have some rule on which one you're going to use as caller ID. Because you can have multiple routable routable addresses. <coughs> for other parts. And of course, you can use wildcards. If anyone dials, you know, a certain number, you can take the last five digits and tag it onto the MZ. And sure, sure. I mean, the the normal way. I mean, if you take the sort of default scripts. They just do a lookup in the database, but asterisk is scriptable. You can you can do all kinds of stuff with it. We'll, we'll dig into some of that. We'll try to get out of the talking part here and get into an actual um, mm -hmm. uh, get Alexander up here with the actual system soon. Okay. This is how we do the authentic. This is how authentication is run. Um, on this side, this is a SIP challenge response authentication. It's actually modeled after an HTTP challenge response authentication. On this side, it's uh, GSM challenge response authentication. But the, uh, the corresponding, what happens, you know, this is channel setup, location updating request comes in, it just contains an MZ or a TMZ. Well, if it's a TMZ, we translate it to an MZ and we send it to the SIP registry, you know, SIP register method. The register will come back with a 401 unauthorized, but the 401 <coughs> unauthorized carries the nonce. It carries the RAND value. The RAND value gets sent back to the handset authentication request. We get back an authentication response. We issue a second register. The second register looks like the, looks almost exactly like the first register, except it contains the nonce and the result and sends them again. This time, if it matches, you get back to 200 OK, location of dating, etc. Let's get the issues being set. Again, generating stems. Um, yeah. If you really want to do authentication, you have to know KVI. The only way you're going to is to put it there because it's a write-only operation. So. So, a little bit of talk about Cypher. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this needs to be updated some more than the Wikipedia page is actually more than the So, current versions of OpenBTS um, generate TMZs on a per BTS basis. So we discussed this earlier. We said, yeah, in normal network, TMZs are globally significant. Well, yeah, except no BTS that are actually on a local basis. And when you move to another base station, at some point you have to expose your TMZs. Um, that needs to be changed in future revisions, but it's not been changed yet. So, also, current releases of OpenBTS don't support any type of encryption. So, in GSM, the, in GSM terminology, the cipher, the session ciphering algorithm is designated A5, and we don't have any type of A5. Well, we support A50, which is no ciphering at all. Um, again, this is going to change very soon um, because I know that. Um, Fairways people are working on this, and Arrange Networks are also working on this. So this is going to change real quick. Which one? Which version? So, um, quick story. The big button 3 is not on here, so here's the story. Um, when GS, everyone knows the story of 851 and 852. 851's a strong encryption. 85 that was used in Europe and North America. 852 was designed intended for export to everywhere else in the world. The problem with A52 is when it, it, it was so weak that uh, a, a type of attack called a, a semi-active downgrade attack allows you to um, put a phone, use an MZ catcher to put a phone in an A52 session, and then from that A52 session you uh, extract information that could then be used for cracking keys from previous A51 sessions that have been pulled in on passive intercept. Um, so the weakness of A52 became a threat to security of A51. And um, A52 was depreciated, I uh, forget what year, I think it's 2004 or something. A52 was depreciated. The GSMA told carriers to stop supporting it and told vendors to stop, stop putting it in the hardware. 
Um, so if you know new phones made today are supposed to support 852. If you see a phone that supports 852, it's pretty old. Um, Depreciation or deprecation? Sorry, I did. Uh, deprecation. Okay, thanks. Yeah. 851, at the same time this happened, 851 was subject to a lot of export restrictions, which means that there was a short period of time where legally, if you were outside of the United States and North America, if you're outside of North America and Europe legally, there was nothing you could use except for 850. Um, that's been changed. The export restrictions on 851 have been lifted. Um, so now just about everyone in the world is using 851 as their, as their sort of standard encryption. However, there is a new generation of very fast, reasonably inexpensive 851 crackers that are starting to proliferate. So it's getting to the point now that for less, for the bargain price of less than $200,000, you can crank out 851 keys at the rate of a few per second. Um, so now people are starting to um, look at 851 a little differently. Um, so there's another algorithm not on the list, A53. A53 was intended for use in UMTS networks, but any dual mode handset that supports both UMTS and GSM will use A, can use A53 in its GSM mode, and A53 is becoming more and more common. So if you look at a lot of networks in the world today, you'll find that about a quarter of the calls are already encrypted with 853. And that's just going to grow over time. So what we'll probably see in a few years is 851 will also be deprecated and removed from the system and just replaced with 853. And then following on to that, there's another generation of more open out, open <coughs> algorithms. One of the problems with 851 was that it was developed in secret by people who weren't really expert cryptographers. Um, that they know better now. Um, which side picked, uh, I mean, which side, so the network on the handset uh, picked which algorithm to use? The network. Yeah. That's true. And you, the answer to any question like that in GSM is always the network. The handset is an absolute slave of the network. It controls nothing about its own activity. Okay. So, uh, do, you, do you know which version do you plan on supporting? We're going to support 851 and 853. Um, so, so what's what's encrypted? You know, is it is it just exchange of MC or what? It, no, no. It depends on in a well managed network. In a well managed network, everything beyond everything beyond the initial the initial exposure of an identity token is encrypted. Okay. So, you know, the handset, the first message on the, on the dedicated channel always contains an identity token. It'll be an MZ or a Everything after that will be, as soon as, the, as soon as the network knows the identity of the handset, it'll engage encryption. At least it's supposed to. Um, there's also the question of how often session keys get reused, though. Uh, generating set, there's the cost of generating session keys. If you generate too many session keys too quickly, it creates an undue load on your home location register. So what happens is...